Welcome to the Immune Deficiency Foundation's course on primary immunodeficiency and immunoglobulin therapy. This section will cover intravenous immunoglobulin therapy. My name is Kristen Eplin. I'm a nurse practitioner with Midwest Immunology Clinic in Plymouth, Minnesota. I take care of children and adults with primary immunodeficiency receiving immunoglobulin therapy, both intravenously and subcutaneously. This section is going to build on information that you've learned previously, and we're going to start with the history of immunoglobulin therapy. Initially, immunoglobulin therapy was fractionated uh, in the 1940s by the cohen onkley fractionation process. This allowed us to isolate the protein that is the antibody. The initial route for administration really wasn't used until the 1970s or 80s with intramuscular injection. Uh, dosing was very difficult because you could only give small amounts, and if you ask any child who was receiving immunoglobulin in those time frames, the shots were very painful. In the early 1980s, we then became, it became available for us to give intravenous immunoglobulin, uh, and it became commercially available, and this is really what changed the face of primary immunodeficiency treatment. In the 90s, we were expanding the use of immunoglobulin, not just for the primary immunodeficiency diagnosis, but also as an immune modulator for many autoimmune diseases. And early on, a lot of the treatments uh, were for uh, ITP, or idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, and by the mid-2000s is when we have the most recent revolution in immunoglobulin management, and that was uh, the transition from solely intravenous immunoglobulin uh, to subcutaneous forms of immunoglobulin. So what is immunoglobulin? Well, immunoglobulin is made from the human plasma pool. And basically, you're going to see a few pictures here of the processing plants, but it's basically pooled plasma that is filtered down to the lowest largest molecule, which is the protein antibody uh, known as IgG. Uh, what is immune globulin? Immune globulin is pooled from the human plasma pool. It takes about 10,000 to 60,000 donors to make up one lot of immunoglobulin. All of the processes for getting down to the final molecule of the antibody use the same process uh, to get started, and that's the, the fractionation process mentioned before, the cohen onkley fractionation process. After that point in time, um, the processes differ, either from antiviral steps or purification steps or simply just isolating the molecule. Uh, the products are about 95% or greater IgG. They all contain some degree of IgA and IgM, and those are in varying degrees, but the amount of those antibodies in the fractionated immunoglobulin are negligible. Um, the products use different stabilizers, and we're going to go over that in a little more detail later on. Uh, but they are chemical treatments that uh, maintain stability, uh, that improve safety, and this is what varies one product from the, from the next. Um, the multiple safety steps for viral inactivation are important, um, but equal in many of the products. Uh, there are specific steps in filtration, in uh, uh, solvent detergent, uh, that allow the viral particles to be removed. Um, we're going to talk both about the uh, administration routes IV and subcutaneous. All plasma donors undergo a very rigorous donor screening. If you've ever donated plasma or even blood, you know some of the steps that are involved. First of all, the donor itself goes through some pretty rigorous questionnaires, and there are steps along the way that will preclude anybody from donating. Um, and once you make it through the questionnaire, process, uh, then you, you go into a, a risk stratification. Uh, they look at uh, your high-risk behaviors. If you've ever been uh, high-risk behavior, they look at your donor history. Um, and then lastly, from the donor, from the safety uh, profile, they look at your lab tests. So when you donate plasma, uh, the first thing that comes off of your plasma are serologic tests, syphilis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, uh, HIV antibodies, and PCRs uh, for HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. Uh, they're also screening for uh, parvovirus uh, B19, um, and these are usually by PCR methods uh, because antibodies are very prevalent, and having antibody positive status for, for parvovirus B19 does not preclude you from donating. They also take a look at your hematocrit levels, your liver functions, um, various other lab tests that may show an at-risk individual. They also do background checks. Um, you have to have uh, two separate donations 
in order to be considered a contributor to the plasma pool. If you don't come back for donation, your initial plasma donation will be discarded. That's because they want to be able to track your laboratory studies to have two separate points of data. Um, it's also very helpful to know that everybody who donates plasma is a part of a national donor deferral program. So if you've ever been deferred for blood donation or plasma, you will not be accepted as a plasma pool donator. donator. The immunoglobulin, the, the plasma pool uh, is traceable. So as a donor, uh, whether you contribute to uh, BioLife or Baxter or any other uh, commercial plasma collection, uh, you will be registered nationally. So after you donate your plasma, your plasma is actually quarantined for 60 days. Uh, there's reasons for that uh, that include, like I mentioned before, your laboratory studies. So we want to make sure that your initial laboratory studies are reviewed uh, and clear you for donation. Then after that point, your plasma is still held and uh, um, you have to donate twice in six months in order for your plasma to be used in the pool. After your uh, plasma has been included in the plasma pool, the pooled plasma is then fractionated. Uh, ethanol fractionation in the presence of cold uh, is take, it, it takes the plasma proteins down to the level of the antibody. Depth filtration with the use of, use of multiple sized filters then further purifies that protein, and then chromatography then helps to separate out uh, the actual IgG molecule. Then after that point in time, the pool is tested uh, for viral safety, and then it goes on to additional safety steps such as pasteurization, uh, low pH, low pH with pepsin, uh, solvent detergent which helps to dissolve the lipid enveloped viruses such as hepatitis C, and then again chromatography. Uh, then again, the plasma pools are tested. If any point in time a pool fails the testing, it's then taken out of uh, circulation. Uh, nanofiltration is one of the latest validation measures that excludes uh, viral sizes. Here's some pictures of the processing plants. Um, these are from various processing plants that use various methods of um, filtration, chromatography, and solvent detergent. Different manufacturers use different combinations of each one of these uh, for viral inactivation. But the fact of the matter is that even in the 80s, when we were not solvent detergent processing our immunoglobulin products, HIV was not contracted through any of the immunoglobulin products. Each IVIG package insert will tout their various steps in viral inactivation, uh, and they're very well regulated uh, by FDA. So then we get to the actual replacement and infusion of IgG. Uh, the goal with immunoglobulin replacement uh, can be two. Number one, replacing missing antibodies and maintaining adequate serum IgG in patients who have immunoglobulin deficiency. These would be diagnosis that we'll talk about, that, that we've already talked about along the way, common variable immunodeficiency, X-linked A-gamma globulinemia, um, hypogamma globulinemia. Secondly, we want to give protective levels of specific antibodies. For instance, we want to make sure that uh, we have protective titers of pneumococcus, protective titers of diphtheria and tetanus in each of the um, manufacturer's product. The dosing guidelines, and they are just guidelines, not mandates, state that you can, you can begin immunoglobulin with a goal of 400 to 800 milligrams per kilogram. We tend to dose on the higher end for patients who have chronic infection at diagnosis, and specifically, guidelines for, for treatment of bronchiectasis um, may, ma may require a larger doses per kilogram. Immunoglobulin therapy for primary immunodeficiency diagnosis are usually lifelong. The exceptions for these are hypogamma globulinemia in infancy uh, or prematurity, uh, and secondary hypogamma globulinemia of uh, therapies such as lymphoma therapies or post chemotherapy or during bone marrow transplant. So the goal to optimizing IgG replacement therapy is to maintain efficacy and decrease episodes of infection. That's with primary immune deficiency. We also want to make sure that we're giving a product that has the lowest risk profile for the patient, and we're going to talk about that more specifically on how to stratify that but we want to make sure that adverse reactions are minimal for the patient. We want tolerability to be primary goal uh, for patients.
We also want to make sure that peaks and troughs are even in the patient so that they're not feeling a wear-off effect when they hit their trough in IVIG infusions. And we'll talk a little more about that as well. Convenient administration with flexible scheduling is important for patients when you tell them this is going to be a lifelong therapy. We want to make sure that it fits with their life and not their life fitting with their disease. We also want to make sure that the therapy proposed to them is cost effective and uh, authorized by their insurance in most cases because cash pay for this therapy uh, is nearly impossible. This next slide shows the commercially available uh, manufacturers of intravenous immunoglobulin therapy. Take some time to look over this slide. What I want this slide to impress upon you is the fact that there are varying degrees of concentrations that are available for intravenous products, varying from a 3% concentration to a 10 or 12% concentration, depending on how products are reconstituted. You can take your time and look through this and understand that um, the varying degrees of sodium concentration uh, are, and pH are going to be important as we look at the potential side effects. I also want you to be aware that, um, that there are varying degrees of IgA content in all of the products and we will talk about how important that is in the findings and uh, choice uh, for patients. Key factors to consider in immunoglobulin management. Again, the concentration of the product. We're going to talk specifically about when you should use a low concentration product like a 3% or a high concentration product IV such as a 10%. The osmolality of the product. Uh, physiologic osmolality is around 300. So a product that increases osmolality may increase the potential for side effects, uh, especially when given in high, uh, high content. Uh, stabilizers are important as some are more sensitive to others and the sodium content may be important if you're dealing with the elderly or the very young. So it's important for you, even as the nurses, to understand a patient's comorbidity. If the patient has comorbid factors such as diabetes, hypertension, or fluid overload, then one product choice over another may make more sense. What I want you to understand in this next part of the presentation is that not all IVIG products are equal and not every product is right for every patient. I think that tolerability sometimes has to be established simply uh, with trial and error. And we'll talk about how to start that process and how to provide feedback on a patient's tolerability. Let's first start by talking about concentration. So the concentration of an immunoglobulin product can range from 3% to 12%. Right now, you can reconstitute Caramune and F to either a 3% concentration by adding more water to your, your lyophilized product or a 12% solution by adding less. But preparations that are given at higher concentrations, while they may decrease the volume load for the patient, may increase uh, hyperosmolar side effects such as headache. So for example, a 70 kilogram patient that's infused at two grams per kilogram, which would be the immune modulating dosing, uh, of a 10% formula would be getting 1400 mLs of immunoglobulin. If we reconstituted that to a 5% concentration, while we decrease the osmolality, we increase the volume load by double. So here's the risk factors I want you to think about if you have a patient on immunoglobulin therapy. Is this a patient who's at risk for congestive heart failure? Is this a very old or very young patient where fluid load is going to be a problem and may necessitate the addition of diuretics? Is there renal dysfunction? Does the patient have a previous history of elevated BUN, elevated creatinine, or is prone to dehydration, or is even coming to you with dehydration? Uh, in, that, in that case, a lower concentrated product may be more appropriate. If the patient is already hypertensive or has a history of cardiovascular disease or even peripheral vascular disease, higher concentration may equal higher osmolality and may increase the side effects. Now, talking about osmolality. Now, osmolality and concentration don't always go hand in hand, so it's important for you, going back to that slide, to look at physiologic osmolality versus the osmolality of the infused product. Lyophilized products reconstitute, reconstitute to a higher concentration will give you a hyperosmolar solution. Hyperosmotic states may be implicated in, in prothrombotic complications such as deep vein thrombus or pulmonary embolus. So we recommend that when a patient is started on immunoglobulin therapy initially, that high-risk patients, especially patients who've had previous DVTs or previous stroke, uh, be looked at 
uh, with pre-infusion labs that may help us to isolate a coagulation disorder. We also recommend slower infusion rates and that early infusions be given in controlled settings. So who are these patients that we're talking about here? The patients who are at risk are patients with previous cardiovascular events, such as heart attack or stroke, patients who are presently dealing with congestive heart failure, uh, hypercoagulability patients, so a patient who maybe has a known factor V Leiden diagnosis or has maybe a strong family history of blood clots, uh, renal dysfunction patients, advanced age hyperproteinemia, and these are patients who are often elderly, but these are the patients who are most typically prescribed the higher dosing of immunoglobulin, uh, coronary artery disease going along with the heart failure and uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, and then hypertension and vascular disease. Different products use different stabilizers, so let's talk about their stabilizers a little bit. Uh, there is not one stabilizer that is judged to be better than another, but there are differences that are worth talking about so that we can help stratify a patient's risk. So IVIG stabi stability is impacted by a lot of factors. It's impacted by the stabilizer that's used, it's impacted by the pH of the product, the protein concentration of the product, and also how we store it. The function of a stabilizer is to prevent the product from degrading. Stabilizers have gotten better over time. Uh, there are now most immunoglobulin products that can be stored outside of the refrigerator. Uh, but the stabilizer is designed to help prevent aggregates uh, from forming that can create uh, side effects in the patient when they're infused. Various stabilizers have been associated with various adverse events, and we're going to talk about these a little bit because I think it's important to look at the patient profile when you're discussing which product and which stabilizer is going to be best for the patient. Let's start out by talking about sucrose. Sucrose stabilizer is associated with renal failure rates. In fact, 90% of all renal failure associated with immunoglobulin infusion has been associated with products containing sucrose as the stabilizer. There is also glucose that's used as a stabilizer in products, and you can review that chart that you can always go back to that. The glucose stabilizer may be a poor choice in individuals who are diabetic because it's going to increase their insulin needs. Uh, it may also interfere with their blood glucose monitoring, as will stabilizers such as maltose. So the recommendations is that we always start a patient out on immunoglobulin with good hydration. We don't want to take a dehydrated patient and add high doses of sucrose or high doses of glucose um, without helping to balance their fluid beforehand. Uh, Pre-infusion labs in high-risk patients are sometimes a necessity. If you have a patient who has known renal failure, um, we want to make sure that A, we probably wouldn't want the physician to choose a sucrose-stabilized product, but B, let's make sure that they're not coming into their infusion dehydrated, and perhaps a suggestion of a, uh, every pre-infusion BUN and creatinine uh, would be appropriate. This is for patients who already have known renal failure. Recommendations for slower infusion rates may be appropriate for patients receiving large doses. So what are the patient risk factors that make us have to think about stabilizers? Well, I think absolutely number one on my list is diabetes. If your patient is a diabetic, I would strongly suggest that we stay away from sucrose con containing products. And right now on the market, the only product containing sucrose is Caramune NF. We also want to know about pre-existing renal disease. Before a patient starts immunoglobulin therapy, we should at least have a baseline creatinine and BUN. Concomitant nephrotoxic drugs. So oftentimes we're using immunoglobulin for secondary immunodeficiencies uh, such as those associated with chemotherapy. In these cases, the chemotherapeutic agent may be nephrotoxic, and the protein load and perhaps the sucrose load we add with immunoglobulin uh, can be devastating. So I think monitoring renal function in patients who are on concomitant nephrotoxic drugs is very important. Again, advanced age and uh, hyperproteinemia or paraproteinemia um, in elderly patients is important. And again, the cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, when you have a patient with cardio risk cardiovascular risk factors, uh, you also have renal failure risk factors. And if that's the case, avoiding a sucrose stabilizer is appropriate. So here are some of the other sugars uh, that are involved in the stabilization product. Uh, sugar has been used as a stabilizer. Um, there are some products out there that have no sugars as stabilizers. But the concentration of the sugar will definitely affect the osmolality of the product um, and can create a hyperosmolar product.
Again, I, I have on this slide that 90% of IVIG-induced acute renal failure episodes have been associated with products containing sucrose. So again, we want to make sure that we are assessing a patient for pre-existing renal risks and diabetes. So you can see on the right of this slide that the stabilizers of sucrose have been associated with 90% of the adverse reactions associated with stabilizers. Uh, glucose and maltose, 8%. Uh, and also I'd like to point out here that maltose can interfere with some of the standard blood glucose monitoring. Um, so patients need to be aware of that if they are routinely monitoring their blood glucose at home. Sorbitol. Uh, is another stabilizer that is used in immunoglobulin. Uh, sorbitol metabolizes to fructose, and there is a condition called hereditary fructose intolerance, and as rare as it is, uh, can be devastating uh, in patients who are given large doses of sorbitol. Um, L-proline, uh, L-proline has recently uh, been used in the two of the newer generation immunoglobulin products, both IV and sub-Q. And L proline loads are contraindicated in patients who have a condition called hyperprolinemia. The problem is, is we often don't know that a patient has hyperprolinemia uh, until they get a proline load, and then they have side effects. The, the good news about the side effects are that they're often um, very affecting to the quality of life to the point where a patient will report that they're having side effects that will make you want to stop therapy. Uh, maltose, again, can affect glucose monitoring. Um, it causes erroneous results. There are now workarounds for maltose, uh, and most of the blood glucose meters now have changed, so this becomes less of an issue. Let's talk about sodium content in immunoglobulin. So the sodium content, as you can see from that chart, uh, varies widely in preparations. It goes from a trace amount to, only, to almost a 1% concentration. Significant amounts of Sodium can be given with large doses of immunoglobulin, especially if you have a small patient. And this can definitely affect the fluid balance. Concentrating some preparations from a 5% to a 10% solution will also affect sodium content. And concentrating or, or reconstituting uh, products with saline, which I don't think has been done for a while, will, can make some preparations as high in sodium content as 2%. So the recommendation is that while the package insert indicates that you can reconstitute lyophilized products with sodium, um, normal saline, that we use sterile water for reconstitution to keep the sodium content low. High sodium content has undesirable side effects related to the fluid balance, um, but in congestive heart failure patients, this can be dramatic. As also in very small neonates and young children, uh, once you upset that fluid balance, uh, you, you can put yourself open for uh, devastating side effects. Again, renal dysfunction must be taken into consideration, so I go back to the recommendation that baseline renal function should be on file. I make sure that my patients have yearly chemistries done. If they're tolerating the therapy, fine. Uh, we suggest that they do yearly BUN and creatinines along with yearly liver functions. Here's the factor that I want to spend some time talking about because this seems to be a factor that is a very, um, how to be diplomatic, uh, controversial in immunoglobulin therapy, and that's IgA content. When we first learn about immunoglobulin infusions, one of the things that is driven home to us is that patients who have selective IgA deficiency or the absence of IgA cannot receive immunoglobulin products because there is IgA content in them. That works on the basis that every patient who has no IgA in their blood is able to make an anti-IgA antibody. So this is what I'd like you to take home from this. Patients who have selective IgA deficiency, and that's an IgA of less than one in the serum, and also has the ability to produce anti-IgA antibodies may be at risk for having adverse reactions associated with anaphylaxis. Now, all IVIG brands have some content of IgA but not all patients with selective IgA deficiency are at risk for anaphylaxis. The, co the complication of anaphylaxis with IgA-containing pro products is extremely rare, and with subcutaneous products who also, that also contain IgA, uh, it is extremely rare. Uh, what we suggest in a patient who has selective IgA deficiency 
is that the patient be aware that there is a potential complication if they do make IgA antibodies, but that all first infusions and second infusions be given in a controlled setting where emergency um, steps are available. But the biggest thing to, to take home from this is that selective IgA deficiency is not an absolute contraindication for receiving immunoglobulin. Part of the reason is that when you have a diagnosis of common variable immunodeficiency that you learned about previously, most patients will have a little to no IgA. But what's important to note about common variable immune deficiency is these are also patients that don't make any antibody very well. So if they don't make an anti-IgA antibody, then the risk of anaphylaxis is very rare. There have been studies that have taken place that have even looked at individuals who have the presence of an anti-IgA antibody, either IgG type or IgE type antibody, and they are given subcutaneous immunoglobulin products, and the risk of anaphylaxis was minimal. I would like to do a case study at this point uh, and take a look at a diagnosis that's already been made uh, and to work through the selection of product and where the nursing science comes in in the selection of product. So here we have a 41-year-old woman who presents to the immunology clinic with chronic productive cough, fatigue, uh, and chronic sinusitis or rhinosinusitis. Her history is that she has had repetitive infections her entire life. As a child, it was otitis media, cystitis, chronic diarrhea, recurrent pneumonias. Uh, she's had multiple sinus surgeries. Uh, she also has uh, hypertension, uh, and it's not well controlled. She has impaired glucose tolerance and has been deemed pre-diabetic with fasting blood glucose of 120. So she comes in, her immunologist does her first set of labs, and we find out that her total IgG level is 100. Normal range uh, is somewhere around 620 to 1400. Her IgA is low at 30. Normal would be around 80. And her IgM is slightly low, also 25. Normal would be 45 to 250. So thinking back on what you've previously learned, you can understand that she ends up with a diagnosis of common variable immunodeficiency. Now you can do a lot of fancy testing. You can look at B cell subsets. You can look at memory B cells. You can look at a complete immune deficiency panel with T cell, NK cells, helper, suppressor. But in the end, after all that is said and done, she has the diagnosis of common variable immunodeficiency. So let's talk about how we're going to make some decisions about this patient. Now, I fully understand that the nurse is not making the product selection, but the nurse should be processing this risk profile exactly the same as the physician. Number one, can this patient take a volume load? Is she at risk for volume overload? Number two, is osmolality or osmolarity going to be a factor in her? What's the sodium content of her product, and is that going to affect what product we choose for her based on her fluid balance. IgA content, do we need to worry about an IgA loaded product? pH, do we have to worry about pH for her? And is sucrose as a stabilizer a good choice? So let's look at those one by one. First of all, volume load. So the concentration in fluid volume may impact her hypertension, especially because, as we saw on the previous slides, her hypertension is not under good control. Osmolality and osmolarity um, may be important to her because she's hypertensive, but also because she has diabetes. So perhaps choosing a lyophilized product that's reconstituted may not be the best choice for her, and certainly not reconstituting it with a normal saline prep uh, preparation, because sodium content also could influence her fluid balance. Uh, her IgA content, probably not all that important. She has IgA. Her IgA level was 30, so we don't have to worry about her having anti-IgA antibodies. pH. Mm, you know, she's not elderly, she's not a tiny neonate, so pH is probably not a very important factor for this woman. But the stabilizing agent, again, I bring you back to the fact that she is a diabetic or a pre-diabetic. Use of a glucose-stabilized product, and certainly a sucrose-stabilized product, may not be a good choice for her. So here's what we did. We identified her risk factors, right? She's hypertensive, she's diabetic. She's not elderly, she's not a neonate, so the other factors really can be uh, poo-pooed at this point. Her optimal product factors, when we talk about selection, is we probably want to go with a high concentration product so that we don't upset her fluid balance load. We definitely want to choose a non-sugar stabilizer and probably choosing a low-sodium product, 
but at a very minimum, not reconstituting a product with sodium. But again, the lesson of this case study, as before, is to understand that not all products are created equal. There should be a lot of thought that goes into the product, not just, this is what my pharmacy has on the shelf, and this is what I'd like her to receive. So here's how we match a patient with an IVIG product. Um, I have found over time that this chart has been beneficial for me. Um, we need to look at the following factors, cardiac disease, renal disease, the presence of anti-IgA antibodies or selective IgA deficiency. Have they had a previous thromboembolic event? Are they diabetic or pre-diabetic? Are they elderly and fragile? Or are they teeny tiny neonates and fragile? And so if you look at how these dots are distributed, um, you should be able to isolate the factors that are important in your decision making. So let's take a look at some IVIG adverse reactions. Anybody who's infused immunoglobulin could write this slide um, because if you either hear it during the infusion or you're gonna hear about it for a couple of days after the infusion. While IVIG brands are different per manufacturer, the listing of side effects is almost identical in each package insert. So here's a list of some of the common reactions. Headache, nausea, fever and chills, flushing, wheezing, vomiting, backache, uh, chest tightness. Um, most of these side effects on this slide are rate-related reactions. If a patient is in the midst of an infusion and begins to complain of any of these side effects, your first intervention is to slow down your rate, if not discontinue, until the symptoms come back under control. There are rare serious side effects of IVIG therapy, and they can happen during an infusion or they can happen days after an infusion. Thrombosis. Therapy with intravenous immunoglobulin has the potential to make a patient hypercoagulable. This, of course, is going to be compounded if there is a personal history of hypercoagulable events or a strong family history of thrombosis. Aseptic meningitis. This is not necessarily a side effect that's going to show up during your infusion, but a day or two after, the patient may experience a crushing back of the head, nuchal rigidity, um, light sensitivity, nausea, headache, oftentimes mistaken for viral meningitis. Uh, stroke, again, another prothrombotic event. Anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic shock can happen in the midst of your infusion. It can happen in the midst of your first infusion, or it could happen in the midst of your 40th infusion. Um, it very rarely will happen post-infusion. And renal failure. Renal failure is a post-infusion severe reaction. It will not happen during your infusion. And most of these side effects listed here are not necessarily rate-related. So this is a busy slide, but this is one that I think is worth printing out. Management of common adverse events is very important for you because you're first line in the infusion. Most side effects are rate related. So if we slow or stop the infusion, most of the side effects will resolve. And I've always felt that it's very impressive how quickly the symptoms resolve when the infusion is stopped. If a patient tolerates several infusions, then you can titrate the rate up. The same is true for during an infusion where side effects are experienced. So Sally's getting her infusion. You titrated her rate up to 100 cc's per hour, and 15 minutes into 100 cc's per hour, she complains of headache and nausea. At that point, you either slow her infusion rate or stop her until infusion reactions cease, and then you can titrate her back up again by slowly resuming the same titration schedule and get her again to a rate that she can tolerate. It's very possible that she can get up to 100 cc's per hour without side effects. If you are unable to get her back to a reasonable infusion rate, you may want to make a suggestion to the prescriber to talk about some pharmacologic intervention pre-infusion to help us get the rate up. So this slide talks a little bit about management of common IVIG adverse reactions. These reactions that I'm referring to are the ones that are happening in front of you as the nurse who's doing the infusion. Most of the side effects are rate related like I mentioned before. If it's a rate related side effect, headache, rigors, body ache, back ache, nausea, your first intervention is to stop or slow the infusion. So if you're infusing Sally at 100 mLs per hour and you've titrated her up to that rate over her hour 
previously. And when you are 15 minutes into her 100 cc's per hour, she decides to have an adverse reaction. Your first intervention, of course, is to stop or slow the rate. Once you've done that, you may be impressed by how quickly the symptoms resolve. After the symptoms are completely resolved, you can begin titration back up to her maximum tolerated dose. You may, or rate, you may be surprised that you can actually get her going again at 100 cc's per hour without side effect. But if you can't, and the infusion rate is too slow, seems unreasonably slow, um, you may want to speak to her prescribing physician about a pre-medication regimen using pharmacologic intervention. First of all, we usually start out with analgesics such as Tylenol or ibuprofen. Uh, giving these 20 to 30 minutes before an infusion is started and repeating them every four hours during the infusion uh, may be your simplest way to control those side effects. Sometimes if headache occurs inevitably with each infusion, we'll add a migraine medication in as a pre-medication like Imitrex or Maxalt uh, or Midrin or Fioracet instead of using ibuprofen or Tylenol. There are uh, people who absolutely cannot tolerate even the lowest infusion rates without antihistamine therapy. For these people, I typically am having them take a long-acting antihistamine before they come to the infusion center, something along the lines of cetirizine or Zyrtec, uh, Claritin or Loratadine, or Allegra, Fexofenadine. Um, these offer you antihistamine protection throughout the entire duration of the infusion. On top of that, you can also use medications such as diphenhydramine, either orally or IV. Uh, if the patient needs that extra antihistamine. And sometimes this is what's needed when a patient has headache, body ache, or nausea. Pretreatments with antiemetics in patients who can't get control of the nausea, such as Zofran or Compazine, have been used on occasion. I don't do them routinely. And uh, IV steroids or oral steroids, either prior to infusion or for a period of time after infusion, are fairly common. I do not pre-medicate patients routinely unless they are unable to tolerate infusion rates um, that are reasonable. Um, medications that I've used, Salucortef IV, uh, given 15 minutes before initiation of the infusion. Uh, I have some patients receiving low-dose Solumedrol, uh, which is a little longer acting uh, than the Salucortef. Uh, Post-infusion, I've given oral steroids, such as prednisone or Medrol, uh, or for children or Pred or Prelone. Product changes may be necessary. As I sort of talked about in the first part of this presentation, not every product is created equal. So if you have a patient who's receiving a proline-based product, and despite premedication, despite good hydration, despite all of your tricks, you cannot get the patient to experience an infusion at a reasonable rate without side effects, we want to talk about um, switching the product. The physician may not know these side effects are occurring. Oftentimes patient will go, patients will go into an immunoglobulin infusion expecting side effects, and I think that's wrong. I think we should be able to get a patient safely infused with immunoglobulin in a reasonable period of time without side effects. If you as the first line are not seeing that happen in a patient, that's when communication becomes really important with the prescriber. Of course, this is not to tell you your nursing job, but comfort measures go a long way in these patients. Uh, heating pads, uh, sometimes the higher concentrated products like a 12% caramune product will cause a local phlebitis at the site of the IV. So trying a heating pad may be helpful, that's simple. Allowing the patient a comfortable environment to fall asleep in, especially if you're pre-medicating with diphenhydramine, um, will, I think, dispel a lot of anxieties for one, uh, but also helps with headaches. Slow the rate of infusion. Like I said, pay attention. Ask the patient, how are you doing? How are you feeling? I mean, don't go fishing for, does your head hurt? Does your head hurt? But simply asking them to stay in touch with you. And the last one I have in all caps with an exclamation point because I think it's very important. Hydration status coming into an infusion may predict the rate of nuisance type side effects after an infusion. So one of our mantras in our outpatient infusion center is come in hydrated, Hydrate while you're there, and hydrate when you're home. So plan on sending this patient home uh, with instructions uh, to get 64 ounces of fluid down over the next two days. So when a bunch of nurses were asked um, what were the most common side effects of immunoglobulin infusion, here was their responses. And I like that this is broken up into uh, lyophilized products, or powder on the right, or liquid products in the center. Um, 
these are nurse reported, keep in mind. So nurses reported uh, that the largest collection of side effect was headache, and I would agree with that in my practice. And then you can follow it down from there. Uh, the liquid and the powder products uh, did not seem to have a huge amount of difference um, from the nurses that were reporting. So here are our infusion rate guidelines. Uh, the first thing to note here is that policy must be written to first and foremost follow manufacturer's suggested rates of infusion because each product is different. The rate of infusion should be titrated starting at the lowest infusion rate and trying on every patient to get them up to their maximum tolerated rate, whether that be maxed out by the package insert or by patient tolerability is up to the nurse to decide. If a patient experiences an adverse reaction, decrease the rate until symptoms resolve. I think I've said that enough right now. Assess the patient for risk factors that may alter your ability to ramp up that infusion rate. Um, renal status, you know, fluid status. Uh, how about IV access? If you only have a little 24 gauge gelco in, your rate is gonna be limited by that alone. Assess the status of the patient for infection as they come in for their infusion or as you're coming to them for their infusion. A patient who is acutely and actively infection, infected may be more at risk for an adverse reaction. Uh, and these reactions are going to be anywhere from headache, uh, chills, uh, body aches, uh, to aseptic meningitis. So if you have a patient uh, who comes in with a fever, uh, you need to check with the provider on what their infusion guidelines are. I typically will not infuse, infuse a patient, their IVIG, if their fever is over 100 degrees mostly because increased risk of side effects. When you're switching brands, so say for instance Sally, who was getting her infusion, uh, couldn't tolerate 100 cc's per hour. Her infusions were taking too long. Actually, we're gonna do a case study on this too. But um, we pre-medicate her, we did all of our nursing magic, we hydrated her, we sent her home with good instructions, and yet she would come back each time and say, I had three days of headache after the infusion. This is when nursing needs to open up the lines of communication with the prescribers and talk about perhaps changing the product. Perhaps it's a proline issue, perhaps it's a sucrose issue, maybe it's the stabilizer, maybe it's the sodium. But as you now know, not all product is crea products are created equal. So switching products at that point when you've tried to work all your magic and not been able to make the patient comfortable is appropriate. I typically will ask a patient uh, to give us three tries to make them comfortable, either by slowing the rate or adding uh, uh, a pre-medication or a mid-medication or working on hydration issues. If at that point we can't get them comfortable, that's the time when I would suggest a product change. Okay, so here's our case study now. Um, this is a 33-year-old woman uh, who has non-erosive seronegative arthritis. Uh, her past medical history is that she's had recurrent viral infections with herpes zoster. She's had four pneumonias in her last five years. So this is a 30-something-year-old woman who now is getting pneumonias in her 30s. Uh, intermittent diarrhea, that's been an almost lifelong problem for her. Um, she comes to you for assessment. Uh, her hemoglobin's a little low. Uh, her IgG's a little low. Um, her IgA is very low, which may explain the diarrhea, uh, and her IgM is normal. So with this constellation of symptoms and laboratory studies, she comes up with the diagnosis of common variable immunodeficiency. The prescribed therapy is intravenous immunoglobulin, SD. This is a lyophilized product. We're gonna give her um, four to 500 milligrams per kilogram. That's the prescription you come out with. She also was given a prescription for metronidazole because of her chronic diarrhea. And uh, I, I can't recall if she had a positive Giardia culture or we were treating presumptively. So she gets her first treatment. During the infusion, she complained of headache, dizziness, nausea, uh, and you slowed it way down because you couldn't get her comfortable. The rate that finally made her comfortable made her infusion last six hours at 500 milligrams per kilogram. What do we do next? Well, like I mentioned before, I will oftentimes uh, ask this patient to give us three tries. Um, but here are our options. A, discontinue her IVIG. B, discontinue her metronidazole because that's obviously causing those side effects. C, decrease the dose of her immunoglobulin. D, switch her to another brand at that point. E, decrease her infusion rate to the point where she doesn't experience side effects. We already did that. F, 
explain the nature of IgG therapy and common side effects and tell her that she just needs to deal. G, consider premedicating her, or H, again, decrease the rate of her infusion. So looking at all of our options here to consider how to proceed with therapy for this 33-year-old woman, um, there are not a lot of wrong answers, um, but let's go through the wrong answers first. Uh, discontinuing IVIG therapy after one infusion is not an option. I think we have to make her understand that sometimes uh, we have to do a trial and error in order to get the therapy comfortable for her. Uh, so I think answer A is wrong. And discontinue the metronidazole, answer B, also wrong, because the metronidazole therapy is unrelated to her infusions. There should be no contraindication for her to receive metronidazole along with her immunoglobulin. Um, so the answer to that is, is wrong. Decreasing her current IVIG dose uh, is not right. Uh, oftentimes, as you will refer back to what I said earlier, this is not dose-related, it's rate-related side effects. Switching to another brand is right. Uh, is it right at this point in time? Um, and, and you're going to probably get varying opinions on this. I think a physician who is caring for this woman would like to know that your first infusion did not go well. Uh, and together, you can throw out the options. But switching to another brand at this point would not be inappropriate. Um, decreasing her infusion rate is not an option uh, because she is already complaining that the infusion took too long. And again, like I said before, we have to make this therapy fit into her life and not her life fit into this therapy. Uh, explain the nature of Ig therapy. Well, that should already have been done. She should understand exactly where her immunoglobulin came from. She should understand exactly um, why we give it the way we do. Um, but she does not have to deal with the side effects. Uh, we have not nearly uh, tried enough options for her to, to settle into that yet. Consider pre-medication. This would be number one on my list. The patient needs to be pre-medicated. Um, and you can start this in an algorithm uh, suggestion, starting with something as simple as acetaminophen and ibuprofen. Um, or we could go right into hydrocortisone. Uh, in, in my opinion, uh, this is a patient that I would do both uh, acetaminophen uh, pre-infusion and an IV dose of solumedrol and that's an uh, opinion that you could give to the prescriber uh, to help this patient tolerate therapy better. Uh, decreasing her rate of infusion, again that's silly, she's already taking six hours. So here are some other considerations to think about for immunoglobulin and we're wrapping it up here. Um, first of all, like I said before, not all therapies are considered equal, not all products are the same. There is one product, Gamunex, now called Gamunex C, that is only compatible with D5W in your flush. So at, as, at an infusion center or in a home care uh, situation, you need to flush that line with D5W instead of a saline flush at the end. All other products can be flushed with normal saline or D5W. Uh, so some institutions have taken a stance that all flushes will be D5W to assure that no incompatibility occurs. Here's what I want all of us to think about when we're talking about a patient who's being considered for IVIG therapy. Um, as a prescriber, the prescribers need to be sure that they are up to date, that they're expanding their clinical knowledge and using clinical evidence in their prescribing. Um, the prescribers also need to appreciate that at this point, from a safety standpoint, immunoglobulin has a very excellent safety margin. Pharmacists. Pharmacists also need to understand that not all immunoglobulin products are considered equal. To say that a hospital, outpatient infusion center, or home care company only carries one brand of immunoglobulin is to say that they're not honoring that. Nurses. Nurses need to be on the patient's side to help improve convenience for immunoglobulin and to be working towards making this therapy fit into the patient's life. And one of the ways we can do that is by trying to increase infusion rates uh, to decrease the time commitment. Patients. Patients are responsible for reporting their tolerability. I think that they will appreciate that over the past 20 years we have improved patient tolerability. And patients should also be trying to work toward rapid infusion rates. Patient organizations like the Immune Deficiency Foundation are responsible for patient education, making sure that the patient is educated, that the infusion nurses are educated, that the prescribers are educated, uh, and to make sure that all of the above have adequate, reliable resources to turn to. Safety is a big concern for patient organizations, that they should be backing safety, backing research into improved safety, um, and uh, product availability as well. Here's your responsibility. 
As a nurse, your responsibility is to do a very good pre-infusion assessment. That your responsibility is to understand the patient's risk factors, uh, and if those have not been adequately communicated to the prescriber, that you do so. Uh, secondly, when you re make your return visit for your next infusion, ask them how they did. They may think that they always have to suffer for a day or two after the infusion, and that's not true. Ask them what happened after your last infusion. Did you call your doctor after your last infusion? Did you have a headache? Sp get very specific because patients, especially elderly patients, will think that their side effects are normal. And I would encourage you to think differently. Um, adverse reactions to different products is very important. So this has happened to me as an infusion nurse before that I'll go to a patient's home and they don't know the product that they're getting. They don't know uh, when they had it last. Um, they don't know a history of what products they've received. The Immune Deficiency Foundation has been very hallmark in helping patients track these with infusion notebooks um, so that if a patient goes to a new immunologist and says, I used to receive IVIG, um, but I had horrible side effects, and that physician says, well, what product did you receive? And the patient has no idea. Well, then you're starting from scratch again, and the patient is at risk for having side effects from that same product. So as a nurse, you can then support the patient in taking some responsibility in what products they use, how they do with each product, and what infusion rates have they tolerated. Um, also, as, as a nurse, again, a risk profile assessment. Are they diabetic? Have they had a blood clot? Uh, have they had renal failure? Are they presently on dialysis? All of those things are very important. Monitoring during the administration. Um, do patients self-infuse immunoglobulin? Yes. Does that mean they need no monitoring? No. A patient should always have monitoring during their infusion, which means they're not infusing alone. Um, if you are not physically present to monitor the infusion, they need to make sure that they have another adult uh, who is trained in the supervision of the infusion uh, and is trained in reporting side effects. And then a follow-up uh, with the nursing staff uh, with the patient, either by phone or in person. How'd you do? How are you doing? Periodically touching base. Are you having side effects? How are the infusions going? Um, how to intervene and manage adverse reactions was outlined um, in this presentation. I think now that you have an understanding of what to expect, uh, you can start troubleshooting some of these side effects. But again, overall, communication is the key. If side effects are happening, they need to be communicated back to the prescriber because it may be six months before this infusion patient sees their prescribing doctor again. And then the last on this slide is to discharge the patient with good instructions. Uh, Post-infusion management is important. I oftentimes will uh, give them drinking guidelines. You need to drink X amount of liquid uh, before tomorrow. Or tomorrow, I want you to finish you know, X amount of bottles of Gatorade um, because that will then give them something concrete to focus on so that they are more intentional about their rehydration. Also, they need to have contact numbers. Here's what I want you to do if you get a headache. I want you to call you know, me. I want you to call your doctor. You, know, you need to work that out with the prescriber on how they want that communicated. Um, here are emergencies. If a patient receives immunoglobulin and has any of these symptoms post-infusion, these are emergencies that need to be handled through the prescriber or the emergency medicine provider. Shortness of breath or chest tightness, uh, chest pain that radiates into the shoulder or down the arm, leg pain or lower leg swelling, um, redness or heat in a, in a limb, it, usually a leg, but if it were an arm, uh, decreased urine output or no urine output despite the fact that you encourage them to rehydrate aggressively. Sudden weight gain um, and fluid retention which would go along with a sudden weight gain. These are all reasons for a patient to seek emergency care after an immunoglobulin infusion and this is referring back to a patient's risk of severe reactions such as thromboembolic events. In conclusion, uh, Looking back on what you've learned over the past sessions of immunoglobulin management, you've understood that there are multiple overlapping mechanisms of action with immunoglobulin therapy. There are multiple labeled and non-labeled indications for usage. Their dosing guidelines are different, whether it be for autoimmune disease or primary immunodeficiency replacement. There are various IVIG products available on the market. The biggest lesson to take home is that not all products are created equal. 
that the nurse can help stratify risk factors for a patient by being aware of comorbid factors that may be helpful for the physician when choosing a product. IVIG product determination should be based on safety, tolerability, and that stratification of patient risk factors. Thank you.